The music of Sergei Rachmaninoff occupies an unusual place in the 20th century repertoire. The sweeping lyricism, lavish harmonies, and plush textures that are so characteristic of his music express a romantic aesthetic that was quite out of step with the compositional trends of his time, which emphasized intellectualism over subjectivity and led to such radical expansions of musical language that the common practices of the previous 500 years were effectively overturned. As a result, critics and scholars have tended to see Rachmaninoff's music as an anachronistic holdover of Tchaikovskyan Romanticism, an assessment that generally hasn't been shared by lay listeners. A broader appreciation for Rachmaninoff's music has been complicated by the relative irregularity of his output. As one of the greatest piano virtuosi of his era, Rachmaninoff relied on income from concert performances to support himself and his family for most of his professional career. This conflict between his demanding performance schedule and his creative work intensified considerably in the wake of the Russian Revolution, which forced him to live in exile for the rest of his life. Between 1918 and his death in 1943, Rachmaninoff settled variously in New York, Switzerland, and Beverly Hills. While his villa in Switzerland provided him with a peaceful environment in which he could spend his summers composing, America was the place where concert touring was both the most lucrative and the most physically punishing. As a result, Rachmaninoff completed only six works over the final 25 years of his life. Thus, the evolution of his style was subtle. While his music would remain opulently expressive in ways that harken back to the music of late 19th century Russia, his late works show a greater interest in textural clarity and rhythmic incision. <laughs> Rachmaninoff began composing the Third Symphony in the summer of 1935, almost 30 years after he'd written his last work in the genre, his popular Symphony No. 2 in E minor. Working in a disciplined manner for almost two and a half months, he was able to complete the first two movements, but was forced to put the piece aside to prepare for the upcoming concert season. The following April, he took up the work again, finishing it at the end of June. The symphony was premiered on November 6, 1936, by the Philadelphia Orchestra under Leopold Stokowski. Interestingly, both critics and the public reacted negatively to the piece, albeit for different reasons. Although critics in the first half of the 20th century often responded to significant diversions from conventional musical language with either skepticism or outright hostility, they largely accepted the premise that innovation was the most important criterion for evaluating new music, and in this regard, Rachmaninoff's third was considered to be insufficient. On the other hand, the style of the symphony was enough of a departure from the more uniformly luxuriant, sensuous aesthetic of some of its most popular previous works that audiences responded to the piece with ambivalence. In spite of these reactions, Rachmaninoff continued to think of his third and final symphony as one of his best works, and over the past 30 to 40 years, it has become increasingly well regarded. <laughs> Rachmaninoff's three-movement third symphony contains many of his musical trademarks. Like its predecessors, it has a motto theme that appears in various forms throughout the piece, here derived from plain chant and played at the outset by an unusual combination of clarinet, solo horn, and cello. And the Roman Catholic chant for the dead, the Dies Irae, which appears in four of Rachmaninoff's other major works, makes its evocative appearance in this symphony's prevailingly cheery finale. Sweeping melodies and lush textures abound, a reminder of the debt American composers of film music owe to Rachmaninoff. There are subtle surprises as well, such as long stretches of music that recall the harmonies and textures of Debussy, the idea of embedding a scherzo in the middle of the slow movement to essentially expand the symphony into a conventional four-movement structure, and a thrilling section in the finale in which Rachmaninoff displays his often overlooked mastery of counterpoint. The overall result is a symphony of great syntactical diversity and flexibility of expression that is a worthy addition to Rachmaninoff's highly appealing body of work.